strange colored hide and his unaccountable gait that at, that at a time when everybody was a connoisseur in horse flesh, the appearance of the said pony at Meal, which place he had entered about a quarter of an hour before by the gate of Vogency, produced an unfavorable feeling which extended to his master. And this feeling had been the more painfully perceived by the young Diard, Diardigan, Diardagnan. For so was the Don Quixote of his second Rosinet named from his not being able to conceal from himself the ridiculous appearance that such a steed gave him. Good horseman as he was, he had sighed deeply, therefore, when accepting the gift of the pony from Monsieur Diardagnan, the elder. He was not ignorant that such a beast was worth at least twenty livers, livers, and the worst and the words which accompanied the present were above all price. My son said the old Gascon gentleman in that pure barren patois of which Henry the Fourth could never get rid. My son, this horse was born in the house of your father about thirteen years ago, and has remained in it ever since, which ought to make you love it. Never sell it, allow it to die tranquilly and honorably of old age, and if you make a campaign with it, take as much care of it as you would of an old servant. The court provided you have ever the honor to go there, continued Monsieur Diardinan, the elder, an honor which, an honor to which, remember your ancient nobility gives you the right, sustain worthily your name of gentleman has been worthily borne by your ancestors during five hundred years. By these I mean your relations and friends, endure nothing from any one but Monsieur le Cardinal and the King. It is by his courage. Please to observe it. Please to observe by his courage alone that a gentleman can make his way nowadays. Whoever trembles for a second perhaps allows the bait to escape, which during that exact second fortune held out to him. You are young. You ought to be brave for two reasons. The first is that you are a Gascon, and the second is that you are my son. Never fear quarrels, but seek hazardous adventures. I have taught you how to handle a sword. You have thews of iron, a wrist of steel. Fight on all occasions. Fight the more for duels being forbidden, since consequently there, it, there is twice as much courage in fighting. I have nothing to give you, my son, but fifteen crowns, my horse, and the counsels you have just heard. Your mother will add to them a recipe for a certain balsam, which she had from a bohemian, and which was the miraculous virtue of curing all wounds that do not reach the heart. Take advantage of all and live happily and long. I have but one word to add, and that is to propose an example to you. Not mine, for I myself have never appeared in court, and have not and have only taken part in religious wars as a volunteer. I speak of Monsieur de Trivio, who was formerly my neighbor and who had the honor to be as a child the playfellow for our the playfellow of our King Louis the Eighth, whom God preserve. Sometimes their play degenerated into battles, and in these battles the king was not always the stronger. The blows which he received from him gave him a great esteem and friendship of Monsieur de Treville. Afterward, Monsieur de Treville fought with others in his first journey to Paris five times from the death of the late king to the majority of the young one without reckoning wars and sieges. Seven times, and from that majority up to the present day, a hundred times perhaps, so that in spite of edicts, ordinances and decrees, there he is a captain of the musketeers, that is to say, leader of a legion of Caesars, whom the king holds in great esteem, and whom the cardinal dreads. He who dreads nothing, as it is said. Still further, Monsieur de Treville gains ten thousand crowns a year. He is therefore a great noble. He began as you begin. Go to him with this letter, and make him your model order that you may do as he has done. Upon which Monsieur de Ardagnan, the elder, girded his own sword. Around his son, kissed him tenderly on both cheeks, and gave him his benediction. On leaving the paternal chamber, the young man found his mother, who was 
was waiting for him, the famous recipe of which the counsels we have just repeated would necessitate the so frequent employment. The adieu, a bit adieu, the adieu went on this side, longer and more tender than they had been on the others. Not that Monsieur d'Artagnan did not have his son, who was his only offspring, that Monsieur d'Artagnan was a man, and he would have considered it unworthy of a man to give way to his feelings, whereas Madame d'Artagnan was a woman, and still more a mother. She wept abundantly, and let us speak it to the praise of Monsieur d'Artagnan, the younger, notwithstanding the efforts he made to be as firm as a future musketeer ought to be. Nature prevailed, and he had in many years of which he succeeded with great difficulty in concealing the hound. The same day the young man set forward on his journey, furnished with the three paternal presents, which consisted, as we have said, of fifteen crowns, the horse, and the letter from Monsieur de Treville, the counsels being thrown into the bargain. With such a vague macum, D'Artagnan was morally and physically an exact copy of the hero of Cervantes, to whom we so happily compared him, when our duty of an, of an historian were so happily compared him, when our duty of an historian places under the necessity of sketching his portrait, Don Quixote took windmills for giants, and sleep for armies. D'Artagnan took every smile as for an insult, and every look as a provocation, whence it resulted that from Darbe's to Myong, his fist was constantly doubled, or his hand on the hilt of his sword. And yet the, the fist did not descend upon any jaw, nor did the sword issue from its scabbard. It was not that the sight of the wretched pony did not excite numerous smiles on the countenances of passers-by, but as against the side of this pony rattled a sword of respectable length, and as over this sword gleamed an eye rather ferocious than haughty, uh, these said passers-by repressed their hilarity, or if hilarity these prevailed other prudence, they endeavored to laugh only to one side, like the masks of the ancients. D'Artagnan then remained majestic and intact in his susceptibility till he came to his unlucky, to this unlucky city of Mion. But there, as he was alighting from his horse at the gate of the friend Franck of Meunier, without any host, writer, without any one host, waiter, or hostler, coming to hold his stirrup or take his horse, D'Artagnan spied through an open window on the ground floor a gentleman well made and a good carriage, although of rather a stern countenance, talking with two persons who appeared to listen to him with respect. The Ardagnan fancied quite naturally, according to this custom, that he must be the object of their conversation and listen. This time the Ardagnan was only in part mistaken. He himself was not in question, but his horse was. The gentleman appeared to be enumerating all his qualities to his auditors, and, as I have said, the auditors seeming to have great deference for the narrator. They, every moment, burst into fits of laughter. Now, as a half smile was sufficient to awaken the irascibility of the young man, the effect produced upon him by his vociferous mirth may be easily imagined. Nevertheless, Diodagnon was desirous of examining the appearance of his impertinent personage who was laughing at him. Of the examining the, the appearance of this imperfect. Okay. He fixed his haughty eye upon the stranger and perceived a man from forty to forty-five years of age with black and piercing eyes, a pale complexion, a strongly marked nose, and a black and well-shaped mustache. He was dressed in a doublet and a hose of a violet color, with aguilates of the same without any of their ornaments, than the customary slashes through which the skirt appeared. His doublet and hose, though new, uh, looked creased like traveling clothes for a long time, packed up in a portmanteau. Diardagnan made all these remarks with the rapidity of a most minute observer, and doubtless from an indistinctive feeling that this unknown was destined to have a great influence over his future life. Now, at the moment in which Diardagnan fixed his eyes upon the gentleman, in the violet doublet, the gentleman made one of his most 
people who laugh at a wash that would not dare to laugh at the master of it, cried the young emulator of the furious trivial. I do not often laugh, sir, replied the unknown, as you may perceive by the air of my countenance, but nevertheless I retain the privilege of laughing when I please. And I, cried D'Artagnan, will allow no man to laugh when it displeases me. Indeed, sir, continued the unknown, more calm than ever. Well, that is perfectly right. And turning on to, and turning on his heel, was about to re-enter the hostelry by the front gate under which D'Artagnan, on, on arriving, had observed a saddle horse. But D'Artagnan was not of character to allow a man to escape him thus, who had the insolence to laugh at him. He drew his sword entirely from the scabbard and followed him crying, Turn, turn, Master Joker, lest I strike you behind. Strike me, said the other, turning sharply round and surveying the young man with as much astonishment as contempt. Why, my good fellow, you must be mad. Then, in a suppressed tone, as if speaking to himself, This is an anno this is annoying, continued he. What an odd scent this would be for this would be for his majesty who is seeking everywhere for brave fellows to recruit his musketeers. He had scarcely finished when D'Artagnan made such a furious laugh at him that he did had not sprung nimbly backward. He would have jested for the last time. The unknown, then perceiving that the matter was beyond a joke, drew his sword, saluted his adversary, and placed himself on his guard. But at the same time, moment, his two auditors, accompanied by those, fell upon D'Artagnan with sticks, shovels, and tongs. This caused so rapid and complete a diversion to the attack that D'Artagnan's adversary, while the latter turned round to face it, this shower of blows sheathed his sword with the same precision, and from an actor, which he had nearly been, became a spectator of the fight, a part in which he acquitted himself with his usual impassibility, muttering, Nevertheless, a plague upon these Gascons, put him on his orange horse again, and I let him be gone. Not before I've killed you, poltroon, cried D'Artagnan, making the best pace possible and never giving back one step before his three assailants, who continued to shower their blows upon him. Another Gasconade, murmured the gentleman, by my honor, these Gascons are incorrigible. Keep up the dance. And since he will have to, he will have it so. When he is tired, he will perhaps tell tell us that he has enough of it. But the unknown was not acquainted with the headstrong personage he had to do with. D'Artagnan was not the man ever to cry for quarter. The fight was therefore prolonged for some seconds. But at length, D'Artagnan's sword was struck from his hand by the blow of his stick and broken into two pieces. Another blow full upon his forehead at the same moment brought him to the ground covered with blood and almost fainting. It was at this period that people came, came flocking to the scene of action from all parts. The host, fearful of consequences with the help of the servants, carried the wounded man into the kitchen where some trifling attention was bestowed upon him. As to the gentleman, he resumed his place at the window and surveyed the crowd with a certain air of impatience, evidently annoyed by their remaining undispersed. Well, how is it with this madman? exclaimed he, turning round as his opening as the opening door announced the entrance of those who came to inquire if he was unhurt. Your Excellency is safe and sound, as those, oh yes, perfectly safe and sound, my good host, and wish to know what has become of our young man. He is better, said the host, but he fainted quite away. Indeed, said the gentleman, but before he fainted, he collected all his strength to challenge you, and so, and to defy you with challenging you, while challenging you. Why, this fellow must be the devil in person, cried the unknown. Oh, no, your excellency, replied those with a grin of contempt. He is not the devil, for during his fainting he rummaged his police and found nothing but a clean shirt and twelve crowns, which, however, did not prevent his, his uh, saying, as he was fainting, that if such a thing had happened in Paris, you should have instantly repented of it. Well, here you would only have caused 
cause to repent of it at a later period. And then said the unknown coldly, He must be some prince in disguise. I have told you this, good sir, resumed the host, in order that you may be on your guard. Did he name to no one? Did he name no one in his passion? Yes, he struck his pocket and said, We shall see what Monsieur de Treville will think of this insult offered to his protege. Monsieur de Treville said the unknown, becoming attentive. He put his hand upon his pocket while pronouncing the name of Monsieur de Treville. Now, my dear host, while your young man was insensible, you did not fail, I am quite sure, to ascertain what that, block, what that pocket contained. What was there in it? A letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, captain of the musketeers. Indeed, exactly as I have the honor to tell your excellency, the host who was not endowed with great perspicacity, did not observe. The expression which his words had given to this physiognomy, to the physiognomy of the unknown, the latter rose from the front of the windows upon the sill of which he had leaned with his elbow and knitted his brows like a man suddenly rendered uneasy. The devil murmured he between his teeth. Can Treville have said that this Gascon upon me is very young, but a sword thrust and a sword thrust would ever be the of him who was given, him who gives it, and a youth is less to be suspected than an older man, a weak obstacle, and sometimes sufficient to overthrow a great design. And the unknown fell into a reverie, which lasted some minutes. Host said he, could you not contrive to get rid of the frantic boy for me? In conscience I cannot kill him, and yet added he with a coldly menacing expression, and yet he annoys me. Where is he? in my wife's chamber where they are dressing the hearts on the first floor. His, his things and his bag are with him. Has he taken off his doublet? On the contrary, everything is in the kitchen. But if he annoys you, this young crazy fool, to be sure he does, he causes a disturbance in your hostelry which respectable people cannot put up with. Go make out my bill and call my servant. What, sir, do you mean to leave already? You know I was going as I ordered you to let me get my horse saddled. He has not my desire been complied, complied with. Yes, sir, and is your excellency may have had as your excellency may have observed, your horse is in the great gateway ready ready saddled for your departure. That is well, do as I have directed you then. What the devil said those to himself can can he be afraid of this boy? But an imperious glance from the unknown stopped him short. He bowed humbly and retired. The lady must see something of this fellow, continued the stranger. She will soon pass. She is already late. I had better get on horseback and go meet her. I should like, however, to know what this letter addressed to Treville contains. And the unknown, muttering to himself, directed his steps toward the kitchen. In the meantime, the host, who entertained no doubt that it was the presence of the young man that drove the unknown from his hostelry, reascended to his wife's chamber and... Found your Dagnan just recovering his senses. Okay, so we have a little footnote down here. Uh, we are well aware that this term, a lady, is only properly noted, is only properly used when followed by a family name, but we find it thus in the manuscript, and we do not choose to take upon ourselves to offer it. Okay. The lady must see, so... Yeah, okay. So, um, giving him to understand that the police would deal with him pretty severely for having sought a quarrel with the great lord. For in the opinion of those, the unknown could be nothing less than a great lord. He insisted that, notwithstanding his weakness, he should get and get up and depart as quickly as possible. Theodagnan half stupefied without his doublet, and with his head bound up in a linen cloth, arose then, and urged forward by the host, began to descend the stairs. But on arriving at the kitchen, the first thing he saw was his antagonist talking calmly at the step of a heavy carriage drawn by two large Norman horses. His interlocutor, whose head appeared, through the carriage window was a woman of from twenty to two and twenty years of age. We had we have already observed with what rapidity the Artinan seized the expression of a countenance. He perceived then at a glance that this woman was young and bound and beautiful, and her style 
monster. She was talking with great animation with the unknown. His eminence then orders me, said the lady, to return instantly to England and to inform him immediately what duke the duke leaves London. And my other instructions said the fair traveler, ask the fair traveler, uh, they are contained in this box which you will not open until you are on the other side of the channel. Very well, and you, what are you going to do? I, oh, I shall return to Paris. What, without chastising this insolent boy, asked the lady. The unknown was about to reply, but at the moment he opened his mouth, D'Artagnan, who had heard all, rushed forward through the open door. This insolent boy chastises others, cried he, and I have good hope that he whom he needs to chastise will not escape him as he did before. Will not escape him, replied the unknown, knitting his brow. No, before a woman you would not dare to fly, I presume. Remember, said the lady, seeing the unknown lay his hand on the sword, remember that the least delay may ruin everything. True, cried the gentleman. Be gone then on your on your part, and I will depart as quickly on mine. And bowing to the lady, he sprang into his saddle, her, her coachman, at the same time applying his whip vigorously to his horses. The two interlocutors thus separated, taking opposite directions at full count. Your reckoning, your reckoning, vociferated the host whose respect for the traveler was changed into profound contempt on seeing him depart without settling his bill. Pay him, booby, cried then, unknown to his servant, without checking the speed of his horse, and the man, after throwing two or three pieces of silver at the foot of mine host, galloped after his master. Base coward, false gentleman, cried D'Artagnan, springing forward in his turn after the servant. But his wound had rendered him too weak to support such an exertion. Scarcely he had gone ten steps when his ears began to tinkle. A faintness seized upon him. A faintness seized upon seized him, and a cloud of blood passed over his eyes, and he fell in the middle of the street, crying still, Coward, coward, coward. He is a coward indeed, grumbled the host, drawing near to D'Artagnan, and endeavoring by this little flattery to make, make up matters with the young man as the Heron of the fable did with the snail he had despised the evening before. Yes, a base coward murmured to our diamond, but she, she was very beautiful. What she demanded the host, my lady, faltered to your diamond and fainted a second time. Ah, oh, it's all one, said the host. I have lost two customers, but this one remains of whom I am pretty certain for some days to come, and that will be eleven crowns gained at all events. We must remember that eleven crowns was just the amount that was left in D'Artagnan's purse. The host had reckoned upon eleven days of confinement at a crown a day, but he had reckoned without his cast. On the following morning at five o'clock, D'Artagnan arose and, descending to the kitchen without help, asked, among other ingredients, the list of which was not, which has not come down for us, for some oil, some wine, and some rosemary. Uh, and with his mother's recipe in his hand, composed a balsam, uh, which, with which he anointed his numerous wounds, replacing his bandages himself, and positively refusing the assistance of any doctor. Thanks, no doubt, to the efficacy of the Bohemian balsam, and perhaps also thanks to the absence of any doctor, D'Artagnan walked about that same evening was almost cured by the morrow. But when the time came to pay for this rosemary, this oil, and the wine, the only expense the master had incurred, as he had preserved a strict abstinence, while on the contrary, the yellow horse, by the account of the hostler, at least had eaten three times as much as a, a horse of his eyes could reasonably be supposed to have done. D'Artagnan found nothing in his pocket but his little old velvet purse with the eleven crowns it contained. As to the letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, it had disappeared. The young man commenced his search for the letter which the greatest patient, with the greatest patience, turning out his pockets of all kind over and over again, rummaging and re-rummaging in his 
Louis and opening and reopening his purse, but when he had come to the conviction that the letter was not to be found, he flew for the third time into such a rage as was near consu- as was near costing him a fresh consumption of wine, oil, and rosemary, whereupon, seeing his hot-headed youth become exasperated and threatened to destroy everything in the establishment if his letter was not found, though seized his spit. His wife, the broomhandle, and the servants the same sticks they had, they had used the day before. My letter of recommendation, cried Diodagna, my letter of recommendation, or by God's blood, I will spit you all like many, like so many ordolans. Unfortunately, there was one circumstance which created a powerful obstacle to the accomplishment of this threat, which was, as we have related, that his sword had been in his fist, in his first conflict broken in two, and which he had perfectly forgotten. Hence it resulted that when Diodagna proceeded to draw his sword in earnest, he found himself purely and simply armed with the stump of a sword, about eight or ten inches in length, that with those, which the host had carefully placed in the scabbard. As to the rest of the blade, the master had slightly put that on one side to make himself a larding, a larding pen. But this deception would probably not have stopped an hard fiery young man if the host had not reflected that the re- reclamation which his guest made was perfectly just. But after all, said he, lowering the point of his bit, where is the letter? Yes, where is the letter? cried Diodagnan. In the first place, I warn you that that letter is from Monsieur de Treville, and it must be found. If it be not quickly found, he will know how to cause it to be found. I'll answer for it. This threat completed the intimidation of the host. After the king went in the cardinal, Monsieur de Treville was the man whose name was perhaps most frequently repeated by the military and even by citizens. There was, to be sure, Father Joseph, but his name was never pronounced with but su- but with a subdued voice. Such was the terror inspired by the gray eminence, as the cardinal's familiar was called. Throwing down his spit then and ordering his wife to do the same with her broom handle and the servants with their sticks, he set the first example of commencing an earnest search for the letter. Does the letter contain anything valuable? demanded the host after a few minutes of useless investigation. Sounds, I think it does, indeed, cried the Gascon, who uh, reckoned upon this letter from making his way at court. It contained my fortune. Bills upon Spain, asked the disturbed host. Bills upon his majesty's private treasury, answered Diotagnan, who reckoning upon the entering into the king's service in consequence of his recommendation. Thought he could make it this somewhat hazardous reply without telling a falsehood. The devil cried the host at his wit's end. But if it's no important, but if it's of no importance, continued your diagnosis with national assurance. If it's of no importance, the money is nothing. That letter was everything. I would rather have lost a thousand pistoles than, than have lost it. He would not have risked more if he had said twenty thousand, but a certain juvenile modesty restrained him. A ray of light all at once broke upon the mind of the host as he was giving himself the devil upon finding nothing. That letter is not lost, cried he. What? said Diodagna. No, it has been stolen from you. Stolen by whom? By the gentleman who was here yesterday. He came down into the kitchen where your doublet was. He remained there some time alone. I would lay a wager. He was he has stolen it. Do you think so? answered Diodagnan, but little convinced as he knew better than anyone else how entirely personal the value of this letter was, and saw nothing in it likely to tempt the cupidity of any one. The fact was that none of the servants, none of the travelers present, could have gained anything by being possessed of this paper. You say, seemed the Otagnan, that you suspect that the impertinent gentleman, that impertinent gentleman, I tell you, I am sure of it, continued the host, when I informed him that your lordship was the protege of Monsieur de Dreville, and that you even had a letter for that illustrious gentleman, he prepared to be very much disturbed, and asked me where the letter was, and immediately came down into the kitchen, where he knew your doublet was. Then that's the man that has robbed me, replied Diodagnan. I will complain to Monsieur de 
said nine livers did not conceal from the young man that he only gave that enormous sum for him on account of that originality of his color. Thus, dear Dagnan entered Paris on foot, carrying his little uh, packet under his arm, and walked about till he found an apartment to be let on terms suited to the scantiness of his means. This chamber was a sort of garret situated in the Rio, in the Rue, Rue de Fossur, near the Luxembourg. As soon as the earnest penny was paid, the Ardagnan took possession of his lodging and paused the remainder of the day in sewing on his on his doublet and hose some ornamental some ornamental braiding which his mother had taken off from an almost new doublet of Monsieur Diodagnan's the elder, and which she had given to him secretly. Next he went to the Calais de Ferrai to have a new blade put to his sword, and then returned toward the Louvre, inquiring of the first musketeer he met with for the situation of the Hotel of Monsieur de Treville, which proved to be the Rue du Vieux Colombier, in the immediate vicinity of the chamber hired by Dear Dagnan, a circumstance which appeared to furnish a happy augury for the success of his journey. After which, satisfied with the way in which he had conducted himself at Mont, he, without remorse for his past, for the past, confident in the present, and full of hope for the future, the retired he retired to bed and slept the sleep of the brave. This sleep, provincial as it was, brought him to nine o'clock in the morning, at which hour he rose in order to repair the residence. Monsieur de Treville, the third personage in the kingdom, in paternal estimation. Very 
lost to David the first. Trivial was one of the, these latter. His was one of those rare organizations endowed with an obedient intelligence like that of the dog with a blind valor, a quick eye, and a prompt hand, to whom sight appeared only to be given to see if the king were dissatisfied with any one, and when the hand to strike the displeasing the dissatisfied with any one, and when the hand to strike this displeasing constant. 
Records, its individual value to each of its courtiers, in addition to the lever of the king and that of the cardinal. There might be reckoned in Paris at that time more than 200 smaller levers, each in its degree attended. Among these 200 levers, that of de Treville was one of the most thronged. The court of his hotel, situated in the Rue de Vaux Colombier, resembled a camp, and that by six o'clock in the, in the morning, in summer, and eight o'clock in winter, from fifty to sixty musketeers who appeared to relieve, relieve each other in order always to present an imposing number paraded constantly about about armed to the teeth and ready for anything one of on one of those on one of those immense staircases upon whose base modern civilization would build a whole house ascended and descended the solicitors of paris who were in search of favors of any kind gentlemen from the provinces anxious to be enrolled and servants in all sorts of liveries bringing and carrying messages between their masters and monsieur de treville in the antechamber upon long circular benches reposed the elect that is to say those who were called in this apartment a continued buzzing prevailed from morning till night while monsieur de treville in his closet contiguous to his antechamber received visits listened to complaints gave the orders and like the king in his balcony at the louvre had only to place himself at the window to review both men in arms the day on which d'artagnan presented himself the assemblage was imposing particularly for a provincial uh, just assemblage uh, just arriving from his province it is true that his provincial was a gascon and that particularly at this period the compatriots of d'artagnan had the reputation of not being easily intimidated when he had once passed the massive door covered with long square square headed nails he fell into the midst of a troop of men and of the sword who crossed each other in their passage calling out quarreling and playing tricks one among another to make way through these turbulent and conflicting waves it required to be an officer a great noble or a pretty woman it was then into the midst of this tumult and disorder that our young men young man advanced with a beating heart raging his long rapier up his lanky leg and keeping one hand on the edge of his cap with that provincial half smile which affects confidence when he had passed one group he began to breathe more freely but he could not help observing that they turned round to look at him and for the first time in his life d'artagnan who had till that day entertained a very good opinion of himself felt that he was the object of ridicule when arrived at the staircase it was still worse there were four musketeers on the bottom steps amusing themselves with the following exercise while ten or twelve of their comrades waited upon the landing place their turns to take their places in the sport one of them placed upon the top stair naked sword in hand prevented or at least endeavored to prevent the three others from going up these three others fenced against him with their agile swords which d'artagnan at first took for foils and believed to be buttoned but he soon perceived by certain scratches that every weapon was pointed and sharpened and that at each of these scratches not only the spectators but even the actors themselves laughed like so many madmen he who at the moment occupied the upper step kept his adversaries in check admirably a circle a circle was formed around them the conditions required that at every that at every hit the person's hit should quit the game losing his turn of audience to the advantage of the person who had hit him in five minutes three were slightly wounded one on the hand another on the chin and the third on the ear by the defender of the stair who himself remained intact a piece of skill which was worth to him according to the agreement three turns of favor however difficult it might be or rather as he pretended it was to astonish our young traveler this pastime really astonished him he had seen in his province that land in which heads become so easily heated a few of the preliminaries of duels but on the gasconades of these four fences appeared to him the strongest he had ever heard even in gascony he believed himself transported into that famous country of giants into which gulliver since went and was so frightened and yet he had not gained the goal for there were
were still at the landing place and the antechamber. On the landing, they were so, they were no longer fighting, but amused themselves with stories about women and in the antechamber with stories about the court. On the landing, D.R. Dagnan blushed. In the antechamber, he trembled. His warm and fickle imagination, which in Gascony had rendered him formidable to young chambermaids and even sometimes to their mistresses, had never dreamed in even in moments of delirium, of half this enormous wonders, or a quarter of the feats of gallantry, which were here set forth, accompanied by names of the best known, and with details the least delicate, but if his morals were shocked on the landing, his respect for the cardinal was scandalized in the antechamber. There, to his great astonishment, the Ardagnan heard the policy which made all, the, all Europe tremble, criticized aloud and openly, as well as the private life of the cardinal, which had brought about the punishment of so many great nobles for having dared to pry into that great man who was so revered by Diodagnan the elder, served as an object of ridicule to the musketeers who cracked their jokes upon his bandy legs and his hump bag. Some sang ballads upon Madame Diagion, his mistress, and Madame Campelet, his niece, while others formed parties and plans to annoy the pages and guards of the Cardinal Duke, all things which appeared to D'Artagnan monstrous impossibilities. Nevertheless, when the name of the king was now and then uttered unthinkably, unthinkingly amid all these cardinal jokes, a sort of gag seemed to close for a moment all these cheering mouths. They looked in they looked hesitatingly around them and appeared to doubt the thickness of the partition between them amid the closet of Monsieur de Treville, but a fresh allusion soon brought back the conversation to his eminence, and then the laughter recovered the loudness, and no coloring was spared to any of this, his sections, to any of his actions. Certes, these follow will, these fellows will all be either imbecile or hung, thought the terrified Diodagnan, and I no doubt with them, for them, or from the moment I have either listened or have heard them, I shall be held to have been an accomplice. What would my good father say, who so strongly pointed out to me the respect due to the cardinal if he knew I was in the society of such pagans? We have no need, therefore, to say that D'Artagnan did not venture to join in the conversation, only he looked with all his eyes and listened with all his ears, stretching his five senses, so as to lose nothing, and in spite of his confidence in the paternal monitions, he felt himself carried by his tastes and led by his instincts to praise rather than to blame the unheard of things which were passing before them. D'Artagnan being, however, a perfect stranger in the crowd of Monsieur de Treville's courtiers, and this is his first appearance in that place, he was at length noticed, and a person came to him and asked him his business there. At this demand, D'Artagnan gave his name very modestly, laid a uh, stress upon laid a stress upon the little compatriot and begged the servant who had put the question to him to request a moment's audience of Monsieur de Treville, a request which the other, with an air of protection, promised to convey in time and season. D'Artagnan, a little recovered from his first surprise, had now leisure to study costumes and countenances. The center of the most animated group was a musketeer of great height, of haughty countenance, and dressed in a costume so peculiar as to attract general attention. He did not wear the uniform cloak, which indeed, at that time, less of liberty than of still greater independence, was not obligatory, but a cerulean blue doublet, a little faded and worn, had over his magnificent baldric worked in gold, which shone like water ripples in the sun. A long cloak of crimson velvet fell in graceful folds from his shoulders, disclosing in front the splendid baldric from which was suspended a gigantic rapier. This musketeer had just come off guard, complained of having a cold, and coughed from time to time affectedly. It was for this reason, and he said those who around him, he had put on his cloak, and while he spoke with a lofty air and twisted his mustache, all admired his embroidered baldric, and the Ardagnan more than any one. What do you make a wonder about, said the musketeer, the fashion is coming in. It is a folly, I admit, but still it is fashion. Besides, one must lay out one's inheritance somehow. Ah, poor those, cried one of his companions, don't think to bomb upon us that you obtained that baldric by paternal generosity. It was given to you by that veiled lady I met you uh, with the other Sunday near the gate, St. Honor. No, bon honored by the faith of a gentleman, I bought it with the con contents of my own purse, answered he whom they dis designated under the name of Porthos. Yes, about in the same manner, said another musketeer, as I bought this new purse with the money my mistress put into the old one. It is true, though, said Porthos, that the proof is that 
increased, though the doubt continued to exist. It is not true, Aramis said, for Porthos, turning toward another musketeer. Is it not true, Aramis said, Porthos, turning toward another musketeer? This other musketeer formed a perfect contrast with his interrogator, who had just designated him by the name of Aramis. He was a stout man of about two or three and twenty, with an open, ingenuous countenance, a black, mild eye, and cheeks rosy and downy as an autumn peach. His delicate mustache marked a perfect, perfectly straight line up upon his upper lip. He appeared to dread the low, to lower his hands, lest their veins should swell, and he pinched the tips of his ears from time to time to preserve, to preserve their delicate pink transparency. Habitually, he spoke little and slowly, bowed frequently, laughed without noise, showing his teeth, which were they, which were fine, and of which, as the rest of his person, he appeared to take great care. He answered the appeal of his of his friend by an affirmative nod of the head. This affirmation appeared to dispel all doubts with regard to the baldric. They continued to admire it, but said no more about it. And with one of the rapid changes of thought, the conversation passed suddenly to another subject. What do you think of the story Chalet's Esquire relates, said another musketeer, without addressing anyone in particular. And what does he say, asked Porthos in a self-sufficient tone. He relates that he met at Brussels Rock Rochefort the Om Domine of the Cardinal, disguised as a Capuchin, and that his cursed Rochefort, thanks to his disguise, had tricked Monsieur de la Guise, like a simpleton as he is, a simpleton indeed, said Porthos, but is, is the, is the, is the matter certain? I, I had it from Aramis, replied the musketeer. Indeed. Why, you know it is, Porthos said Aramis, I told you of it yesterday. Say nothing more about it. Say nothing more about it. That's your opinion, replied Porthos. Say nothing more about it. Psst. You come to your conclusions quickly. What? The cardinal sets a spy upon a gentleman. Has his letter stolen from him by means of a traitor, a brigand, a rascal. Has, with the help of this spy, and thanks to this correspondent, Chalet's throat cut under the stupid pretext that he wanted to kill the king and marry Monsieur to the queen. Nobody knew a word of this enigma. You unraveled it yesterday to the great satisfaction of all, and while we are still gaping with wonder at the news, you come and tell us today. Let us say no more about it. Well, then, let us speak about it since you desire it, replied Aramis patiently. This Rochefort cried for those, if I were poor Chalet, Esquire, should pass a minute of or two very uncomfortably with me, and you, you would pass rather a sad half hour with the Red Duke, replied Aramis. Oh, oh the Red Duke, bravo, bravo, the Red Duke, cried Porthos, clap, clapping his hands and nodding his head. The Red Duke is capital. I'll circulate that saying. Be assured, my dear fellow, who says this Aramis is not a wit? What a misfortune it is if you do not, if you, what a misfortune it is you did not follow your first vocation. What a delightful abbey you would have made. Oh, it's only a temporary postponement, replied Aramis. I shall be one some day. You very well know, Porthos, that I continue to study theology for that purpose. He will be one, as he says, cried Porthos. He will be one sooner or later. Soon, said Aramis. He only waits for one thing to determine him to resume his cassock, which hangs behind his uniform, said another musketeer. What is he waiting for, said another, only till the queen has given an heir to the crown of France. No jokes upon that subject, gentlemen, said Porthos. Thank God the queen is still of an age to give one. They say that Monsieur de Buckingham is in France, replied Aramis, with a significant smile, which gave to his sentences apparently so simple a tolerably scandalous meaning. Aramis, my good friend, this time you are wrong, interrupted Porthos. Your wit is always leading you astray. It uh, interrupted Porthos, your wit is always leading you astray. If Monsieur de Treville heard you, you would re repent of speaking thus. Are you going to teach me better, Porthos, cried Aramis, from whose usually mild eye a flash passed like lightning. My dear fellow, be a musketeer or an abbey, be one or the other, but not both, replied Porthos. You know what Athos told you the other day, you eat at everybody's mess. Ah, don't be angry, I beg of you, that would be useless. You know what is agreed upon between you, Athos, and me. You go to Madame d'Arglion's, and you pay your court to her. You 
Chevreuse and you pass for being far advanced in the good graces of that lady. Oh, good Lord, don't trouble yourself to reveal your good fortunes. No one asks of your secret. All the world knows your discretion. But since you possess that virtue, why the devil don't you make use of it respect, with respect to her majesty? Let whoever likes talk of the king and the cardinal and how he likes, but the queen is sacred, and if anyone speaks of her, let it be well. Porthos, you are as vain as a nar as narcissus. I plainly tell you so, replied Aramis. You know I ain't moralizing, except when it's done by Athos. As to you, good sir, you wear too magnificent a baldric to be strong on that head. I will be an abbey if it suits me. In the meanwhile, I am a musketeer. In that quality, I say what I please, and at this moment, it pleases me to say that you annoy me. Aramis, Porthos, gentlemen, gentlemen, cried the surrounding guests. Monsieur de Treville awaits Monsieur d'Artagnan, cried a servant, throwing open the door of the cabin. At this announcement, during which the door remained open, everyone became mute, and amid the general silence, the young man crossed the antechamber and part of its length, and entered the apartment of the captain of the musketeers, congratulating himself with all his heart as having so narrowly escaped the end of the strange quarrel. Sir, the cardinal related yesterday while playing. 
with the king with an air of condolence. Not very pleasing to me that the day before yesterday, those damned musketeers, those daredevils, he dwelt upon those words with an ironical tone, still more unpleasing to me. Those braggarts, added he, um, glancing at me with his tiger cat's eye, had made a riot in the Rue Ferron in a cabaret, and that a party of his guards, I thought he was going to laugh in my face, had been forced to arrest the rioters. More blue, you must know something about it. Arrest musketeers, you were among them, you were, don't deny it. You were recognized, and the cardinal named you, but it's all my fault. Yes, it's all my fault, because it is myself who select my men.
Monsieur de Trivial 
felt so sacred became an instant the res- became in an instant the recipient of the empty chamber. Everyone spoke. The rain and vociferated, swearing, cursing, and consigning the cardinal and his guards to all the devils. An instant after Porthos and Aramis re entered, the surgeon and Monsieur de Treville alone remaining with the wounded man. At length Monsieur de Treville himself returned. Athos had recovered his senses. The surgeon declared that the situation of the musketeer had nothing in it to render his friends uneasy, his weakness having been purely and simply caused by loss of blood. Swordsmanship in all its branches and dancing, you will make a 
handsome cavalier, a brave youth, quite fit to make his way, should become the dupe of all these artifices, and fall into the snare, after the example of so many others who have been ruined by it. Be assured that I am devoted to both these all-powerful masters, and that my earnest endeavors have no other aim than the service of the king and that of the cardinal, one of the most illustrious geniuses that France has ever produced. Now, young man, regulate your conduct accordingly, and if you entertain, whether from your family, your rel relations, or even from your instincts, any of these enmities which we see constantly breaking out against the cardinal, bid me adieu, and let us separate. I will aid you in many ways, but without attaching you to my person. I hope that my frankness at least will make you my friend, for you are the only young man to whom I have hitherto spoken as I have done to you. Treville said to himself, If the cardinal has set this young fox upon me, he will certainly not have failed. He who knows how bitterly I execrate him to tell his to tell his spy that the best means of making his court to me is to rail at him. Therefore, in spite of all of my protestations, if it be as I suspect, my cunning gossip here will launch out in abuse of his eminence. It, however, proved otherwise. Dear Dagnan answered with the great with the greatest simplicity. I have come to bears with exactly such intentions, sir. My father advised me to stoop to nobody but the king, Monsieur the Cardinal, and you, whom he considered the three first personages in France. Dior Dagnan added Monsieur de Treville to the others, as may be perceived, but he thought this adjunction would do no harm. I hold, therefore, Monsieur the Cardinal in the greatest veneration, continued he, and have the greatest respect for his actions. So much the better for me, sir, if you speak to me, as you say, with frankness, for then you will do me the uh, honor to esteem the resemblance of our opinions. But if you have entertained any doubt, as naturally you may, I feel that I am ruining myself by speaking the truth. But I still trust you will not esteem me the less for it, and that is my object beyond all others. Monsieur de Treville was surprised to the greatest degree. So much penetration, so much frankness created admiration, but did not entirely remove his suspicions. The more this young man was superior to others, the more he was to be dreaded. If he meant to deceive him, nevertheless, he pressed your Dagnan's hand and said to him, you are an honest youth, but at the present moment I can only do for you that which I just now offered. My hotel will always be open to you. Um, hereafter, being able to ask for me with all in a, at all hours, and consequently to take advantage of all opportunities, you will probably obtain that which you desire. That is to say, sir, replied your Dagnan, that you will wait till I have proved myself worthy of it. Well, be assured, added he, with the familiarity of a Gascon, well, uh, you shall not wait long, and he bowed on retiring as if he considered the future was left in his own hands. But wait a minute, said Monsieur de Treville, stopping him. I promised you a letter for the director of the academy. Are you too proud to accept it, young gentleman? No, sir, said Dior Dagnan, and I will answer for it that this one shall not fear like the other. I will guard it so carefully that I will be sworn it shall arrive at its address, and woe be to him who shall attempt to take it from me. Monsieur de Treville smiled at this little flourish, and leaving his young companion in the embrasure of the window, where they had talked together, he seated himself at a table in order to write the promised letter of recommendations. While he was doing this, Dior Dagnan, having no uh, no better employment, amused himself with beating a march upon the window and with looking at the musketeers who went away one after another, following them with his eyes till they disappeared at the turning of the street. Monsieur de Treville, after having written the letter, sealed it, rising, approached the young man in order to give it to him. But at the very moment that Dior Dagnan stretched out his hand to receive it, Monsieur de Treville was highly astonished to see his protege make a sudden spring, become crimson with passion, and rush from the cabinet, crying, Ah, sang he shall not 
not escape me this time. Oh, oh, asked Monsieur de Treville. He my thief, replied D'Artagnan. Ah, the traitors, and he disappeared. The devil take the madman, murmured D. Monsieur de Treville. Unless, added he, this is a cunning mode of escaping, seeing that he has failed in his purpose. Excuse me, 
expressionally strong. It is one that becomes a man accustomed to look his enemies in his face. Ah, uh, but you, I know full well that you don't turn your back to yours. And the young man, delighted with his joke, went away laughing loudly. Porthos foamed with rage and made a movement to rush after D'Artagnan. Presently, presently, cried the latter, when you have in your glow on. At one o'clock, behind the Luxembourg.
which was generally employed as the place for the encounters of men who had no time to lose. When the Ardagnan arrived in sight of the bare spot of ground which extended along the foot of the monastery, eight those had been waiting about five minutes. When the Ardagnan arrived in sight of the bare spot of the ground which extended along the foot of the monastery, eight those had been waiting about five minutes and twelve o'clock was striking. He was then as punctual as the Samaritan woman in the most rigorous casuist with regard casuist with regard to duels who could have nothing to say. Athos, who still s s suffered grievously from his wound, though it had been dressed by Monsieur de Treville's surgeon at nine, was seated on a post and waiting for his adversary with that placid countenance and that noble air which never forsook him. At sight of D'Artagnan, he arose and came politely a few steps to meet him. The latter on his side saluted his adversary with hat in hand and his feather, even touching the ground. Monsieur said, Athos, I am engaged to join my friends at seconds, but these two friends are not yet come. At which I am astonished, as it is not at all their custom to be behind. And I have... I have no seconds on my part, Monsieur, said D'Artagnan, for having only arrived yesterday in Paris, I as yet know no one but Monsieur de Treville, to whom I was recommended by my father, who has the honor to be in some degree one of his friends. Athos reflected for an instant, you know no one but Monsieur de Treville, yes, no, Monsieur, I only know him. Well, but then, continued Athos, speaking partly to himself, um, well, but then, if I kill you, I shall have the air of a boy slayer. Not so, not too much so, replied D'Artagnan with a bow that was not deficient in dignity. Not too much so, since you, since you do me the honor to draw a sword with me while suffering from a wound, which is very painful, very painful upon my word, and you hurt me devilishly, I can tell you. But I will take the left hand, I usually do so in such circumstances. Do not fancy that I favor you. I use both hands equally, and it will be even a disadvantage to you. A left-handed man is very troublesome to people who are not used to it. I regret I did not inform you sooner of this circumstance. You are truly, Monsieur de D'Artagnan, bowing again of a courtesy for which I assure you I am very grateful. You confuse me, replied Athos, with this gentlemanly air. Let's let us talk of something else, if you please. Ah, Sancti, how would you have how you have hurt me? My shoulder quite burns. If you would permit me, said D'Artagnan with a timidity. What, Monsieur? I have a miraculous balsam for wounds, a balsam given to me by my mother, and of which I have made a trial upon myself. Well, well, I am sure that in less than three days this balsam will cure, cure you, and at the end of three days when you would be cured, well, sir, it would still do me a great honor to be your man. D'Artagnan spoke these words with a simplicity that did honor to his courtesy without throwing the least doubt upon his courage. Pardieu, Monsieur, said Athos. That's a proposition that pleases me. Not that I accept it, but it savors of the gentleman a league off. It was thus that spoke the gallant knights of the time of Charlemagne, in whom every knight ought to seek his model. Unfortunately, we do not live in the time of the great emperor. We live in the time of Monsieur the Cardinal. And three days hence, however well the secret might be guarded, it would be known. I say that we were to fight, and our combat it would, would be prevented. I think these fellows will never come. If you are in haste, Monsieur, said D'Artagnan, with the same simplicity with which a moment before he had proposed to him to put it off for the duel for three days. If you are in haste, and if it be your will to dispatch me at once, do not inconvenience yourself, I am ready. Well, that is again well said, cried Athos, with a gracious nod to D'Artagnan, that did not come from a man without brains, and certainly not from a man without heart, without a heart. Monsieur, I love men of your kidney. And I foresee plainly that if we don't kill each other, I shall hereafter have much pleasure in your conversation. We will wait for these gentlemen, if you please. I have plenty of time, and it will be more correct. Ah, here is one of them, I think. In fact, at the end of the Rue Vanguard, the gigantic form of Porthos began to appear. What? cried D'Artagnan. Is your first or second? Monsieur Porthos. Yes, is that not, is that unpleasant to you? Oh, not at all, and here comes the other. D'Artagnan turned in the direction pointed by Athos and Perkins.
received Aramis. What? cried he in an accent of greater astonishment than before. Is your second witness Mount Monsieur Aramis? Doubtless he is. Are you not aware that we are never seen without the others? And what we are called in the musketeers and the guardsmen at court in the city, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, or the three inseparables? And yet, as you come from Dax or Pau, from Tarbe, said D. Ardagnan, it is probable you are ignorant of the circumstance that Athos, Ma foi, replied D. Ardagnan, you are well named, gentlemen, in my adventure, if it should make any noise, will prove at least that your union is not founded upon contrasts. In the meantime, Porthos had come up, waved his hand to Athos, and then, turning toward D. Ardagnan, stood quite astonished, for menaced to say in passing that he had changed his baldric and was without his cloak. Ah, said he, what does this mean? This is the gentleman I am going to fight with, said Athos, pointing to our Dagnan with his hand and saluting him with the same gesture. Why, it is with him I am also going to fight, said Porthos. But not before one o'clock, replied the Dagnan. Well, then I am also am going to fight with that gentleman, said Aramis, coming on the ground as he spoke. But not till two o'clock, said the Dagnan with the same calmness. But what are you going to fight about, Athos? asked Aramis. Ma foi, I don't very well know. He hurt my shoulder, and you, Porthos. Ma foi, I am going to fight because I'm going to fight, answered Porthos, coloring deeply. Athos, whose keen eye lost nothing, perceived a faintly sly smile pass over his lips, over the lips of the young Gascon, as he replied. We had a short discussion upon dress. And you, Aramis, asked Athos, ah, ours is a theological quarrel, said Aramis, making the assigned to Diodagna to keep secret the cause of their dispute. Athos saw a second smile on the lips of Diodagnan. Indeed, said Athos, yes, a passage of St. Augustine, upon which we could not agree, said the Gascon. By Jove, this is a clever fellow, murmured Athos, and now you are all assembled, gentlemen, said Diodagnan, for me to offer you my excuses. At this word, excuses, a cloud passed over the brow of Athos, a haughty smile curled the lip of Porthos, and a negative sign was the reply of Aramis. You do not understand me, gentlemen, said D'Artagnan, throwing up his head, the sharp and bold lines of which were at the moment gilded by a bright sun ray. I ask to be excused in case I should not be able to discharge my debt to all three, for Monsieur Athos has the right to kill me first, which must abate your valor in your own estimation, Monsieur Porthos, and render your yours almost null, Monsieur Aramis. And now... Gentlemen, I repeat, excuse me, but on that account only, and guard. At these words, with the most gallant air possible, D'Artagnan drew his sword. The blood had mounted to the head of D'Artagnan, and at that moment he would have drawn his sword against all the musketeers in the kingdom as willingly as he now did against Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. It was a quarter past midday. The sun was in its zenith, and the spot chosen for the theater of the duel was exposed to its full power. It's very hot, said Athos, drawing his sword in his turn, and yet I cannot take off my doublet, for I just now felt my wound begin to bleed again, and I should not like to annoy Monsieur with the sight of blood which he has not drawn from me himself. That is true, Monsieur, replied D'Artagnan, and whether drawn by myself or another, I assure you I shall always view with regret the blood of so brave a gentleman. I will therefore fight in my doublet as you do. Come, come, enough of compliments, cried Porthos, pleased to remember that we are waiting for our turns. Come, come, enough of compliments, said, cried Porthos, uh, pleased to remember we are waiting for our turns. Speak for yourself when you are inclined to utter such incongruities, interrupted Aramis. For my part, I think what they say is very well said and quite worthy of two gentlemen. When you please, Monsieur, said Athos, putting himself on guard. I waited your order, said D'Artagnan, crossing swords, but scarcely had the two rapiers sounded on meeting when a company of the guards of his eminence commanded by Monsieur de Chazac turned the angle of the convent. The guard, cardinal's guards, the cardinal's guards, cried Aramis and Porthos at the same time. She the swords, gentlemen, she the swords, but it was too late. The two combatants had been seen in a position which left no doubt of their intentions. Hola, cried Jazak, advancing toward them and making a sign to his men to you to do so likewise. Hola, musketeers fighting here, then are you, not the edicts. What has become of them? 
You are very generous gentlemen of the cards and said Athos, which with acrimony for Chazak was one of the aggressors of the preceding day. If we were to see the yon fighting, I can assure you that we would make no effort to prevent you. Leave us alone then and you will enjoy a little amusement without cost to yourself. Gentlemen, said Chazak, it is with great regret that I pronounce the thing impossible. Duty before everything, sheath then if you please and follow us. Monsieur said Aramis, parodying Chazak, it would afford us great pleasure to obey your polite invitation uh, if it depended upon ourselves. But unfortunately, the thing is impossible. Monsieur Trey Treville has forbidden it. Pass on your way then, it is the best thing you can do. This raillery exasperated Chazak. We will charge upon you then, said he, if you disobey. There are five of them, said he, those half allowed, and we are but three. We shall be beaten again and must die on the spot, for on my part I declare I will never appear before the captain again as a conquered man. Athos, Porthos, and Aramis instantly closed in, and Chazak drew up his shoulders. This short interval was sufficient to determine the Artagnan on the part he was to take. It was one of those evenings which decide the life of a man. It was a choice between the king and the cardinal. The choice made, it must be persisted in. To fight was to disobey the law, to risk his head, to make at once an enemy of a minister more powerful than the king himself. All this is the young, all this the young man perceived, and yet to his praise we speak it. He did not hesitate a second, turning toward Athos and his friends. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, said he, allow me to correct your words, if you please. You said you were but three, but it appears to me we are four. But you are not one of us, said Porthos. That's true, replied the Artagnan. I do not wear the uniform, but I am in spirit. My heart is that of a musketeer. I feel it, monsieur, and that impels me on. Withdraw, young man, cried Chazak, with whom doubtless by his gestures and the expression of his countenance had guessed to your Dagnan's design. You may retire, we allow you to do so. Save your skin, be gone quickly. The Dagnan did not move. Decidedly, you are a pretty fellow, said Athos, pressing the young man's hand. Come, come, decide one way or the other, replied Chazak. Well, said Porthos to Aramis, we must do something. Monster is very generous, cried Athos. But all three reflected upon the youth of D'Artagnan and dreaded his inexperience. We should only be three, one of whom is wounded with the addition of a boy, resumed Athos, and yet it will be not the less said we were four men. Yes, but to yield, said Porthos, that's rather difficult, replied Athos. D'Artagnan comprehended one support of his. His irresolution arose. Try me, gentlemen," said he, "and I swear to you by my honor that I will not that I will not go hence if we were conquered." "What is your name, my brave fellow?" said Athos. "Diodagnan, monsieur." "Well then, Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and Diodagnan, forward!" cried Athos. "Come, gentlemen, have you made your minds up?" said Chazak for the third time. "It is done, gentlemen," said Athos. "And what do you mean to do?" said Chazak. "Asked Chazak." "We are about to have the honor of charging you." replied Aramis, lifting his hat with one hand, drawing his sword with the other. Oh, you resist, do you? cried Chazak. Sang dear, said that, does that astonish you? And the nine combatants rushed upon each other with a fury which, however, did not exclude a certain degree of method. Athos fixed upon a certain Cahuzac, a favorite of the cardinals, Porthos at Picrat, and Aramis found himself opposed by two, two adversaries. As to D'Artagnan, he sprang toward Chazak himself. The heart of the young Gascon beat as if it would burst through his side. Not from fear, God be thanked, he had not the shade of it, but with emulation. He fought like a furious tiger, turning ten times around his adversary and changing his ground and his guard twenty times. Chazak was, as was then, a set of fine blade, and had had much practice. Nevertheless, it required all the skill to defend himself against an adversary who, active and energetic, departed every instant from received rules, attacking him on all sides at once, and yet parrying like a man who had the greatest respect for his own epidermis. This contest at length exhausted Chazak's patience. Furious at being held in check by whom he had considered a boy, he became warm and began to commit faults. D'Artagnan, who, though wanting in practice, had a profound theory doubled his agility. Chisok, anxious to put an end to this, and springing forward, aimed a terrible thrust at his adversary, but the latter buried it, and while Chisok was recovering himself, glided like a serpent beneath the blade, 
situation, anxious and rapid glance over the field of battle. Aramis had killed one of his adversaries, but the other pressed him warmly. Nevertheless, Aramis was in a good situation and able to defend himself. Vigoroth Porthos had just made counter hits. Porthos had received a thrust through his arm and Vigoroth one through his thigh, but neither of the wounds was serious and they only fought the more earnestly for them. Athos, wounded again by Cahuzac, became evidently paler, but did not give way by a quick give way of foot. He had only changed his sword hand and fought with his left hand. According to the laws of dueling, at that period, D'Artagnan was at liberty to assist the one he pleased. While he was endeavoring to find out which of his companions stood in greatest need, he caught a glance from Athos. This glance was of sublime eloquence. Athos would have died rather than appeal for help, but he could look, and with that look, ask assistance. D'Artagnan interpreted it with a terrible bound. He sprang to the side of Cahuzac, crying, To me, Monsieur Guard, or I will slay you. Cahuzac turned. It was time for Athos, whose great courage alone supported him, sank upon his knee. Song Dieu cried to D'Artagnan, Do not kill him, young man, I beg of you. I have an old affair to settle with him when I am cured and sound again. Disarm him only. Make sure of his sword. That's it. That's it. Well done. Very well done. This exclamation was drawn from Athos by seeing the sword of Cahuzac fly twenty paces from him. D'Artagnan and Cahuzac sprang forward at the same time. At the same instant, the one to recover, the other to obtain the sword, but Tiordagnan, behind the more active, reached it first and placed it foot, his foot upon it. Cahuzac immediately ran to that one of the guards that Aramis had killed and returned toward Tiordagnan, but on his way he met, he, he met eight those who, during his, this relief which Tiordagnan had procured him, had recovered his breath, and who, for fear that Tiordagnan should kill his enemy, wished to resume the fight. D'Artagnan perceived that it would be disobliging Athos not to leave him alone in a few minutes, and in a few minutes Cusack fell with a sword with a sword thrust with a sword thrust through his throat. At the same instant Aramis placed his sword point on the breast of his fallen enemy and compelled him to ask for mercy. There only then remained Porthos and Picrat. Porthos made a thousand fan fanfernades, asking Picrat what o'clock it could be, and offering him his compliments upon him, his brothers having just obtained a company in the regiment of Navarre. But, joke as he might, he gained no advantage. Big Rock was one of those iron men who never faulted. Nevertheless, it was necessary to put an end to the affair. The watch might come up and take all the, and take all the com combatants, wounded or not, royalists or cardinalists, ate those Aramis and D'Artagnan surrounded Big Rock and required him to surrender. Though alone against all and with a wound in his thigh, Bicarat wished to hold out, but Chisak, who had risen upon his elbow, cried out to him to yield. Bicarat was a Gascon, and Diotagnan was, and he turned a deaf ear and contented himself with laughing in between two parties, finding time to point to, point a, point to a spot of earth with his sword. Here cried he, parodying a verse of the Bible, Here will Bikrat die, the only one of those who are with him. But there are four against you, and leave off, I command you. Ah, if you command me, that's another thing, said Bikrat. You being my brother, it is my duty to obey. And springing backward, he broke his sword across his knees, to avoid the necessity of surrendering it, threw the pieces over the convent wall, and crossed his arms, whistling a cardinalist air. Bravery is always expected, even in it respected. Excuse me, bravery is always respected, even in an enemy. The musketeers saluted Bicarat with their swords and returned them to their sheaths. Jardagnan did the same, then assisted by Bicarat, the only one left standing, he bore Chisak, Kozak, and that one of Aramis's adversaries who was only wounded under the porch of the convent. The fourth, as we have said, was dead. Then they then rang the bell, and carrying away four swords out of five, they took their road, intoxicated with joy, toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville. They walked arm in arm, occupying the whole width of the street, and accosting every musketeer they met, so that in the end became a triumphant march. The heart of D'Artagnan swam in delight. He marched between Athos and Porthos, pressing them tenderly. If I am not yet a musketeer, said he to his new friends, as he passed through the gateway of Monsieur de Treville's hotel, at least I have entered upon my apprenticeship, haven't I? I hope you enjoyed tonight's reading video. And I hope you got some 
and I hope that